Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. Well, I guess this is going to be part four of the sword. I think I'm going to mostly do the New Testament sword. You've got to realize something that when our people tolerate evil, especially the uh, men with men part, um, and I can't mention certain words because of all the censorship and what have you, but uh, it brings curses upon the land, our nations. Uh, the when they talked about freedom of religion, for example, in the Constitution of the United States, and that's where I live, so, you know, um, they were not talking about allowing the Antichrist freedom of religion. Satanists having freedom of religion. No. They were talking about Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians having freedom of worship, Quakers, whatever, you know. I don't even think Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses should be allowed freedom of religion. Uh, I mean, seriously, they're, they're not Christians. They really aren't. If you examine the NIV Bible with the Jehovah's Witness Bible, every entire verse that the NIV deletes is the same verse that the Jehovah's Witness Bible, their New World Order Bible, uh, deletes. I mean, they are, you know, well, they're false prophets. They said the world was going to end in 1975-76. Didn't happen. So, at the very least, they're false prophets. Um, King Josiah got rid of a certain group of people that, uh, you know, of the LB, uh, and then you got the GT, whatever persuasion, got rid of them. And the Lord blessed him. But uh, the land is now cursed. So let me look that up. Let's read about one of my favorite kings in the Bible, King Josiah. Boy, I'll tell you what, um, I think I did a Bible study on Josiah. Let me see, did I? I, You know, I'm getting old, guys, you know, guys and gals, I'm, I'm closer to 70 than I am 60. So what does that tell you? Maybe I got Alzheimer's setting in, I don't know. Yeah, I did a study in Josiah. I thought so. All right, but uh, let's go read about King Josiah. We're going to read 2 Kings chapter 23. Now, you got to realize something. Any unsaved person can be possessed of a devil. Any one of them. I've heard people say, oh, well, Christians could be possessed of devils. I don't believe that, but uh, I don't know. If other people want to believe it, that's that's all right. Just don't, te don't try to teach that on my channel. Go teach it on yours. Um, I see no evidence of that. But, uh, yeah. So, okay. Second... Kings chapter 23, King Josiah, verse 1. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears, all the words of the book of the covenant which is found in the house of the Lord. See, somebody had the foresight to take 
the words of the covenant, which is probably the book of Exodus, what they call the Torah, I guess, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they hit them in the, um, they hit them, I guess, in one of the walls or something, because uh, evidently when they were doing some repairs or remodeling or whatever in the temple, they found this, these scrolls. So, and the king, verse 3, and the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. Here it is, the, the king of Judah made a promise to the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul and to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. Now remember something. There had been a great falling away and wickedness up until this time. Verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove. The witches love to worship in the groves. You know, they're little sacred oaks. Uh, they consider oak trees sacred, um, and they make magic wands out of holly wood. I think it's a coincidence that uh, movies are made there. Uh, uh, don't you kid yourself. All the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. What is the host of heaven? The angels, the fallen ones. And he burned them, the vessels, and he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests. What do you mean he put them down? Uh, you have, ever, have you ever had a dog and had to put it down? You know, what do you think they, what do you think they're talking about here? The idolatrous priests, whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal to the sun, the sun god, and to the moon, the moon god, and to the planets. Uh, you know, I find it interesting. All the planets are named for Greco-Roman gods and goddesses. Mercury, he was the, uh, I think he was the messenger. He was the fast one. Uh, Venus, god of love. Mars, the god of war. Jupiter um, and Saturn, I forget, but more, you know, I think Jupiter was the, uh, I'm not sure. I think he was the king of the gods, sort of like, um, Zeus and whatever. Yeah, you get the idea. And then uh, Neptune was god of the sea. And then, uh, what was it? Pluto. I think Pluto, I'm not sure. Maybe god of the underworld. I don't know. You know. Who named the planets this? Certainly not Christians. No. And if you look at the days of the week, the names, like, uh, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, Sun Day, S-U-N, Day, Day of the Sun, not the Day of the Son of God, new, no, uh-uh. And what about the days of the month? I mean, the, uh, the, the months, same thing. Who named this? Who, who assigned these names to the, you know? America's, we're pagan to the core, satanic. So, they burned incense unto Baal, and Baal is just a, uh, a generic word for Lord. And a Satanist can claim, he can say, oh, Lucifer is Lord, or Baal. No problem, he can say that. And 
it had become that word had become so associated with Satanism that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said, Don't call me that anymore. So they burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. The host of heaven, the fallen angels. Verse 6. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem and unto the book, brook Kidron, and burned it at the book Kidron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereon upon the graves of the children of the people. Listen to this, verse 7. And he break down the houses of the so do mites. Uh, yeah, uh, look up that word. I have to say it, you know, because I don't, that's a bad word. And the censors wouldn't like it. But he broke down their houses that were by the house of the Lord. Oh, your neighbors to the Lord's house? No, you're not. He smashed their homes that were by the house of the Lord where the women wore hangings for the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering of the gate of, Ju uh, gate of Josh Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Um, nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Molech was the god that demanded child sacrifice by fire. Burn your children alive. I wonder what they do with the remains of the children that are in the clinics that they call abort shun clinics do they burn that stuff i don't know doesn't sound too different to me does it uh, boy Verse 11. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering of the, in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. Chariots of the sun. And the altars that were on top of the upper chamber of Ahaz which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them from thence, and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon the king of Israel had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians. Uh, if you don't know who Ashtaroth is, she's a goddess. Uh, some liken her to Easter. What? Chaplain Bob Easter? You mean bunny rabbits and Easter eggs? Yeah, that Easter. Easter was the spring goddess of fertility. She just had different names among different cultures. But it's still the goddess queen of heaven you know uh today the catholics call the queen of heaven mary so yeah you get the idea i do uh, solomon the king of israel had built it for ashtoreth the abomination of the zidonians an abomination 
That's a sin that God really, 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 really hates. Yeah. And for Chemosh, that's another satanic god, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, another satanic god, the abomination of the children of Adam, Ammon, did the king defile. And he break in pieces the images. Boy, I wish somebody would do that in a Catholic church. And cut down the groves and fill their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. Doesn't sound like uh, Josiah the king's playing around here, does it? Boy, I, we need this kind of a revival, but it's not going to happen in our lifetime. 16. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and set and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. And he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah. And proclaim these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. See, one of God's prophets had even prophesied that this would happen one day. And he, the king said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Josiah, man, this I want to shake this guy's hand. This guy meant business. And instead of having a Josiah as a president, we got, we've had the Bushes and Obamas and yeah. And uh, dare I say the Donald. I mean, there's people that actually think he's going to make America great again. I don't think so. But then again, can he be any worse than what we got now? The by den of vipers? I don't know. If you ask me, there are two sides of the same coin. Heads they win and tails we lose. 19. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel... Now, let's take a pause here real quick Josiah is the king of Israel, uh, Judah and now they're talking about the kings of Israel aren't they the same no in Solomon's grandson Israel and Judah divided just like the American Civil War you had the north and the south they had wars against each other different capitals different kings You'll never hear this taught in a Baptist church. Never, 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 never. After all, the you-know-whos are all of Israel. They're God's chosen people. I don't think, well, they are chosen, but not for the kingdom. They're chosen for the place where they're never going to see, um, they're never, they're never going to have to worry about seeing cold weather ever again. They're not going to need a winter coat for the rest of their eternity, if you catch my drift. Unless, of course, they come to Christ. But I doubt, I, I sincerely doubt that. But then again, hey, there were people who thought I would, yeah, let's just say, there's not many people who thought I'd ever be a believer and a teacher. So, nineteen, and all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke, to provoke the Lord to anger. That's what America is doing today. Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And by the way, Bethel. 
Beth means house, and El has reference to God. So Bethel basically means house of God. And it became a house of Satan. 20. And he slew, he killed all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. King Josiah was not playing around here. You ever wonder why you got so many trolls on all the Christian sites? Oh, the Bible's not true. Oh, don't listen to the King James is mistranslated. King James was uh, part of the LB uh, and then, you know, the GT crowd. Or he was a Mason. Or, you know, don't read that Bible. The NIV is a lot better. Uh, you know, the you know who's are God's chosen people. And you... You Christians are just a bunch of Gentiles grafted into this J-wish tree. You know, you hear it over and over and over. You know, I've been to uh, sites where the rabbis talk. I've never seen a, uh, an atheist comment on a rabbi site. Uh, never. Never, never, never. But they come to the Christian sites... Oh, yeah. Oh, you Christians are stupid. Don't you know evolution? Just everything was popped into existence. There's no God, they tell you. You don't see him on rabbi sites. No, you don't. What does that tell you? Yep, King Josiah was not playing around, people. You see... They do everything they can to discredit Christianity and the Bible because they know, the evil ones know, if there was ever a true revival like we're reading about here, their lives would be forfeited. They know that. They're well aware of this. You know what makes me sad is Satanists know the Bible better than the church so-called does. It's sickening. I've had people say, oh, Bob, you're just, you're just too radical. No, I'm lukewarm. I'm lukewarm. I really am. Thing is, they're cold. It's sad. It's sad. And he, Josiah, slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. There was such a revival for Passover that it's like it never, uh, a revival like they never had before. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holden to the Lord in Jerusalem. Listen to this, verse 24. Ooh. All right, verse 24. Moreover, the workers with Familiar spirits. What is a familiar spirit? Well, we're talking about evil spirits, demons, devils. Um, they're well acquainted with them because they're familiar. They're not strangers, you know. It means they're familiar with them. You're familiar with your family. Think about it. I mean, these people probably knew their names. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards, it's a male witch, and the images and the idols and all the abominations, all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away. He got rid of it all. And he didn't give him a bus, a Greyhound bus ticket out of town. No. He uh, fertilized the uh, ground with their, yeah. He fed the worms. 
did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord? And like unto him was there no king before him. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Wow. You think about that. But, but Chaplain Bob, uh, Jesus doesn't want us to be like that. He wants us to love everybody. I don't think so. All right, verse 26. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. Uh, <laughs> wow. So, the Lord was angry because Manasseh was a previous king of Judah that had done a lot of evil, and all the kings before him, I mean, there was, I, I'm kind of guessing, but for every one decent king, there was probably ten bad ones. Yeah. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel. You see, people... The Assyrians came and removed Israel, the northern kingdom. Their capital was Samaria. But Judah wasn't touched. Um, I'm sorry, Jerusalem wasn't touched. Assyria took part of Judah captive too. But they couldn't conquer Jerusalem because the Lord, I think uh, an angel killed 85,000 Assyrian troops that had surrounded Jerusalem. They were all killed. One angel. Yeah. But that's another story altogether. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, My name shall be there. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? I would love to have read that book, but evidently it's lost. So, and then you can read, continue reading, and you read about uh, how Josiah dies in a battle, and his son takes over, and well, and it says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Oh, yeah. So there you go. A lot of people don't realize it, but we are in the same thing today. I mean, we have so many curses against the West. I don't care if you're in the UK, the European Union, or the USSA. It don't matter. We are we're the objects of God's judgment and anger and wrath. He's not playing around. When it comes time for, when he unleashes his judgment, we are in big trouble. And we're almost there. All right, let's move on to the New Testament. Okay, we're going to talk about the words of Christ in red. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Jesus speaking. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, what do you mean confess? I say Jesus Christ is Lord. There you go. Wherefore, oh, I'm sorry, whosoever therefore shall confess me before him, uh, before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. You want Jesus to confess? Oh, yeah, I know this guy. I know this man or this woman. Absolutely. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, 
Oh, I don't know who this Jesus is. Uh-uh. Some will say. When they're looking at a guillotine to get their heads cut off. And they're like, oh, we were promised the pre-trib rapture. Uh, Jesus was a liar. He, he said we wouldn't have to suffer this. No, Jesus didn't lie. Your pastors lied. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Jesus will say, I don't know this one. I never knew you. Verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. You ever heard that, uh, what was that song uh, that they play in December? They call it a Christmas song. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Uh, but Jesus isn't saying that, is he? No. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Oh, there's that sword again. Jesus didn't come to send peace on this earth. He came to, uh, to bring a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father. Yeah, he's going he's gonna to take those believers and they're going to be against their fathers. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Families are going to be divided. Jesus didn't come so that we could all get together and love each other. No, he brings division. And a man's foes, a man's enemies, shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Uh, your eternal life, your if you lose your life, your physical life, for the gospel's sake, then this applies. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. If you lose your life for, the, for Christ's sake, you will find eternal life. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Oh, yeah. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And a good companion verse would be Mark 8.35. Jesus says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You save your physical life in this world to keep from dying for Christ. Well, you're going to lose your eternal life. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. You lose your life for, for the cause of Christ and the gospel, you're going to save your life eternally. Absolutely. Now, in Luke chapter 22, verse 36, Jesus is in the uh, garden. He's getting ready to be betrayed by Judas. And he's there with the eleven. And this is what he says. Then said he unto them, But now 
He that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. What is script? It's a it's a type of money. And he that hath no sword, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. It's funny, Jesus said having a sword was more important than having a garment. Wow. You know, in the times of the Romans, they didn't have gun control or sword control. Jesus didn't say, well, you know, because Julius Caesar's in charge, you know, uh, non-Romans are not allowed to own swords. No. Isn't it funny that there's a certain group of people that are always wanting to disarm our people? Jesus said, having a sword, go buy a sword. But then, all right, so let's get reading here in John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, see, these people were from the temple, not the Romans. Everybody will tell you it was the Romans that arrested Jesus. Uh, 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 uh liars well they're liars whether knowingly or unknowingly but having received a band of men and wep uh and officers from the chief priests these aren't catholic priests these are not rome roman priests and pharisees and all pharisees are jays but not all jays are pharisees some of them were sadducees and supposedly there was a group called the Essenes, which I don't believe they're mentioned in the Bible. I can't find it, but I don't know. They come thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. See, they're not, uh, they're not playing around. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Hey, guys, who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Uh, yeah, you know, they weren't going forward. They were going backward. They fell to the ground. Can you imagine that? Jesus says, I am he, and... Everybody that's with them falls backwards uh, to the ground. Wow. how that happen? Did an angel push them? I don't know. Uh, this would probably make a pretty decent uh, Bible study. Verse 7. Then asked he, Jesus, them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. Hey, you guys looking for me? Leave these guys alone. Leave my disciples alone. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Save the son of perdition, right? Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Wow. Peter is ready to defend Jesus unto the death. And he probably swung for this guy's head, and missed, and just cut off his ear. Huh. And uh, if you read another account of this, Jesus touched the guy's ear and healed him. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? You almost get your head cut off, but your ear, 
your ear's laying on the ground and Jesus touches that, you not only quit bleeding, but your ear, I don't know, e either pops back in place or I don't know, you know, I don't know. I mean, there that would be something, huh? Verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, uh, throw away your sword. You don't know what you're doing. No, he didn't say that. He said, put up thy sword into the sheath. Keep your sword, put it where it belongs. That's basically it, right? The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Oh, okay. See, when I went to Baptist church, they always told me these were the Romans. But the Bible makes them a liar because that's what they are. I know, I'm pretty harsh. Hey, there's no way you can go to Bible college for eight years, have a doctorate degree, and get everything wrong about the you-know-who's that killed Jesus. There's just no way. I mean, how can you read this stuff and then you turn it around and make make a you know liar. Put thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father in law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Hmm, there you go. You want to read the rest? Go ahead. But I'm skipping ahead. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Here's those uh, hateful people. I'll tell you, Paul's a false apostle. They'll tell you that. Paul is a false apostle. Don't listen to Paul, but I do. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Paul writes, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who's going to charge God's elect with heresies or with evil? You know, you ever heard of a... a an officer arrests you and he charges you with a crime? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. It's God that justifies his people. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. What is intercession? That's somebody that acts on your behalf. Yeah. That's, you know, an intermediary. That's what a lawyer is. You go to court, you're charged with a crime between you and the judge, but you got a lawyer there. Your Honor, my client is guilty as charged. However, Christ paid the fine. Oh, yeah. And it helps when uh, the judge is the father of your attorney. You know, God the Father and our intermediary, our attorney, our defense attorney is his son, Christ Jesus. Oh, yeah. Verse 35, Paul asks, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, trouble, or distress, or persecution? Boy, somebody call the Baptist churches and tell them to read Romans chapter 8. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. Who's killed? 
Christians, do you know in the last hundred years has probably been more Christians murdered than in any other time of history? Soviet Russia murdered millions of them. And then the you-know-whos complained, oh, we're not allowed to leave Russia to go back to the, uh, the Israeli state. Well, the Christians couldn't complain about not being able to leave because they were murdered. But the you-know-whos were not murdered. No. Communism didn't murder them. Communism murdered Christians, but not them. Hmm. Uh, make sh think about that for a couple minutes. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And that's Romans 8, 33 through 36. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Another one of Paul's epistles, letters. Ephesus was a Greek city-state. You know why they hate Paul? Because he went to the Greeks and preached to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's people that will tell you, oh, no, 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 no. The, the New Testament was written originally in Hebrew and then mistranslated into the Greek. And those anti-Semitic Greeks mistranslated the Bible. I don't think so. Oh, matter of fact, I know so. All right, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at the word devil. It's the word evil with a D in front of it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, we do wrestle against some flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual battle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, yeah. Look at the capitals of all the provinces, states, uh, nations. Oh, yeah. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. What is the breastplate? What is that, uh, you know, a chest plate? What does that cover? Your heart and your lungs, people. Your heart. You got to guard your heart with righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet should be running to peace and not swift uh, the shed innocent blood. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. Hmm, a helmet of salvation. What does a helmet cover? Your head, your brain, you know, your your eyes and your ears, the hearing of the gospel, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Ooh, the sword, we're, our weapon is supposed to be a sword of a spirit? Wow. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Every time I hear people say, oh, well, all the Bibles are mistranslated. 
I know I'm listening to a devil. Always. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of all saints. You know, the Bible says that those that are in Christ are the saints of God. The, the Pope doesn't decide who the saints are. They might think they do, but they don't. All right, let's read the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Uh, if you start in the New Testament, uh, I'm sorry, if you start reading the Bible from the beginning in Genesis, when you get to Leviticus, it would probably be a good idea to, uh, after you get done with Leviticus to read Hebrews. So, um, the book of Hebrews, we're not even 100% sure who penned the book of Hebrews, but my guess would probably be Paul. So, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hmm. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. You know, God divides the soul and the spirit. Oh, yeah. And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is a sword that divides the wicked from the, e uh, from the good, the wicked from the just, and divides the soul and the spirit. You ever heard people, well, there's a group that call themselves uh, oneness. And they'll tell you God is oneness. And they'll tell you that, well, you know, God is one. And what they're basically doing is tell you that Jesus is not God in the flesh. But the Bible clearly teaches dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Man was made in God's image. Man has a soul, man has a spirit, and man has a body. Three parts make one person. That's why God said in the beginning Genesis, he said, Let us make man in our image, body, soul, and spirit for a man. But uh, Jesus was, I guess, God in the flesh. He would be the body. The soul would be God the Father, and then the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. God is three parts, but he, one, one God in three parts. Oh, that's a trinity. That's a false teaching, the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you. But they don't even know God. So all they know is the Watchtower Society. Blah. So, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. God sees everything. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. One day, every one of us is going to have to, uh, have to deal with the Lord. And the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You better have Christ, or you're in big trouble. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Do you know who that great high priest is? That's Jesus. Why is Jesus called a high priest? You know what? In the Bible, you couldn't even be a priest in God's house until you were 25. You know, guys take longer to mature than women. I'll admit that. You know, a 20-year-old woman is probably about as mature as a 25-year-old man. But 
But to be a high priest, 30 years old was the magic number. Which is why a lot of people say Jesus was 30 years old before he started his ministry. Why? Because he was going to be our high priest. His blood shed on the cross to reconcile us back to the Lord, his Father. Seeing that, that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You think Jesus wasn't tempted the same as all of us were in the flesh? Absolutely was, but he didn't sin. Unless you listen to the rabbis, but they're liars. Let us therefore come boldly, boldly come to the throne of grace. Did you know that Christ's throne is the throne of grace? We're supposed to go there boldly because, after all, he's our defense attorney. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us, uh, to help and find grace to help in the time of need. And boy, that's coming, people. Time of need. Now, we could read Hebrews chapter 11. I call this the faith chapter. I did a Bible study on it about uh, how people were killed for their faith in Christ. Oh, yeah. But uh, you won't hear this taught in Baptist churches because... Uh, hey, Bob, why are you always picking on the Baptists? Oh, well, that's easy. I attended their churches more than any other. I know what they teach, because guess what? I went to a Baptist Bible college. I know exactly what they teach. So, I guess I'm allowed, huh? You know, what we say and do are going to decide whether we are justified in Christ and given eternal life in the kingdom or condemned to the other place. Jesus said, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Oh, yeah. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Now this was written approximately 2,000 years ago, and some people would argue that 2,000 years is not shortly coming to pass. But if you read in the book of 2 Peter, I think it's 2 Peter, 1st or 2 Peter, I forget which, says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So, to from the Lord's perspective, a day or two would be shortly coming to pass. So, and according to legends, uh, well, let me tell you something. Ten of the Lord's twelve apostles died for their faith. Judas hung himself, that's 11, and John was the only apostle that wasn't murdered for his faith. And according to legend, they tried to kill him, but he wouldn't die. I don't know how that works, if it's true, I don't know, but this is why they, according to some, why they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. Him and uh, he had a, uh, a scribe, a, which is like kind of like your uh, secretary, I guess you could say. So, so uh, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. 
Oh, and by the way, this is not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was killed. This is John the Apostle. Different. Verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, Remember, Jesus was begotten from the dead. He died and rose again. That's the gospel, people. Jesus, being born of a virgin, living a sinless life, being crucified and killed, and being raised from the dead. And that's the gospel, people. And the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. Did you know that? unto him that loved us, Christ, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You know what? When you read an NIV or a Jehovah's Witness Bible, they take the word blood out a lot of places. And have washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Christ is going to come in the clouds, just like when he went up in, uh, into heaven. Maybe we should take a look at that. All right, let's read the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Forty days, just like the days of Noah, when the floods came and took the evil people away. Forty days, it rained forty days and forty nights. Jesus fasted for forty days, didn't he? Oh yeah. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you've heard of me. What was the promise? The receiving of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Hey, uh, Lord, you you know, uh, Israel's supposed to be redeemed when the Messiah comes. And you're the Messiah. Are you going to restore Israel now? You know, we're under Roman occupation. And we don't like them very much. And he, Jesus, said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel people, not the same as Jerusalem, which is the capital of Judah, the southern kingdom. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Why to the uttermost part of the earth? Because Israel was scattered everywhere. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he, Jesus, he was taken up. He was taken up. 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he was taken up in a cloud. Boom. Interesting. If you're weird like me, I find it interesting. Verse 10. And while they look steadfastly toward heaven, okay, I mean, they're staring up into heaven. Hey, Jesus is leaving us. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Well, these are angels, people. So these two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? What are you doing standing around here looking up into the, into the sky? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. You seen him go up into heaven in the clouds? He's going to come back in the same way. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. All right. Let's go to verse uh, Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he, Christ, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him. Do you know there's people that will tell you that Christ returned in 70 AD? And this wicked world is his kingdom right now. But they're liars because... Did you see Christ return? Did your eyes see Christ return in glory? Uh, me neither. I mean, this is just, you know, you got so many people that are lying about the Bible. And the only reason they can get away, they, the only reason they can get away with it is because people won't bother to read. But, but the Bible's hard to understand, Chaplain Bob. Well, then get on your hands and knees and fast and pray for understanding. Ask the Lord for understanding. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth, shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. They're going to wail. Oh no, Christ is returning! But the believers, you know what? Let me tell you something. By the time Christ does return, his people are going to be begging for him to return. Begging. They're not begging now. Things are still good. Wait until they're being chased down and murdered and they have no food and, and life is miserable. They're going to beg for Christ's return. But we're not going to see that, Chaplain Bob, because... The pre-trib rapture. Okay, if you say so. You know what? Everybody that teaches that is a false prophet. And God hates false prophets. He is going to be especially harsh on false prophets. Now, whether they are teaching it knowingly or unknowingly, I don't know. That'll be, well, the Word of God, the sword, sword of the Spirit will divide asunder the uh, thoughts and intents of the heart. So, verse 8, Jesus speaking, I am Alpha and Omega. What is Alpha? It's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. That's where you get the word alphabet from, Alpha, Beta. Beta is the second letter. I am Alpha and Omega. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
I mean, they killed all the other apostles. Why didn't they kill John? They killed Stephen too. Where was where was he when? Where was his pre-trib rapture? You want to read about Stephen being killed? Read the book of Acts. Verse ten. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardius and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. You notice Laodicea is last. Do you know that the church council that met, that was deciding what books belonged in the Bible, canon, the scriptures, uh, Laodicea said, uh, we don't like the book of Revelation. We don't think it belongs in the Bible. Because, well, uh, they didn't like what it said about them, about them being rich in physical goods but poor spiritually yeah laodicea god was not pleased all right let's continue reading verse 12 and i turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned i saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man Jesus always, well, not always, but he oftentimes referred to himself as the Son of Man. I mean, after all, he was God come in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 14, you ever heard people say, well, the Bible really doesn't tell you what Jesus looked like. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Revelation 1 and verse 14, his head, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And there's a certain group called the Black Hebrews will tell you, yeah, man, his hair, it'd be wooly, wooly. Yeah, his hair was wooly. Uh, it doesn't say his hair was wooly. It said his hairs were white like wool as white as snow and it wasn't just his hairs it was his head his head and his hairs were white like wool as white as snow oh that's racist chaplain bob well argue with god don't argue with me and his eyes were as a flame of fire uh you ever looked at a stove a gas gas stove what color is that flame uh blue yeah. And his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. What color is brass? It's kind of a golden brown color, right? And somebody that worked in metallurgy told me that if you burn brass in a furnace, it burns white hot with a golden tint to it. And his voice is the voice of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of the mouth of Christ went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, obviously, we're talking a, a figure of speech here. Because, you know, he doesn't have a a sword for a tongue okay remember the Bible says that uh, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword yeah and about out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword out of his mouth the Lord speaks the words and it's likened unto a two-edged sword because it's going to cut people to pieces for the unbelievers And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Did you know it seems that churches have angels? And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are... The seven churches. See, the churches are supposed to give the light of Christ, but they don't do that now. Now they're dens of darkness, if you ask me. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. Jesus speaking, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Yeah, they're poor in the physical realm, but they're rich in the spiritual realm. And I know the blasphemy, blasphemy of them which say they are, you know whose, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Boy, that's something. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. Doesn't say, be thou faithful unto the pre trib rapture. No, uh uh. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Believe me, you want the crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What is the second death? Well, the first death is your body dying, the second death is soul and spirit dying being destroyed in hell. Verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges, which is the word of God, people. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Wow. Satan's throne is there. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Wow. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, which taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Uh, I don't think it's a good thing to sacrifice food that's been dedicated to devils, but and to commit fornication. Uh, Balaam was a prophet of the Lord, actually. Balak was a king of, I forget who, maybe the Moabites or the Ammonites, I forget which, or whatever. But... Um, Balaam said, oh, I can't curse the children of Israel, but I can tell you what you can do. Have them to eat food sacrificed unto the devil, idols, and take your hot-looking women and make sure they're not wearing much clothes and have them prance around. Get, get them boys interested and uh, let, them, let them mess around with your women and God will be mad at them and then let you destroy them. Oh, yeah. You think Satan? Satan's been watching us for about 6,000 years. You think he don't know? You think he doesn't know what, how to have lead us into getting uh, God angry at us? So that God will say, I'm sick of these people. You can have them, Satan. You can destroy them. I don't care. Oh, yeah. You want to... You want to worship the devil? Let the devil save you. Verse 15. So hast 
Thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Uh, there's some debate about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So I can't comment on it with any certainty. Jesus says, repent. Now, some people will tell you that when the Lord says to repent, it means to uh, stop your unbelief. Uh, but how can a church repent of their unbelief? You're talking about a believing church. So repent here has to be turn away from the evil things, you know, your fornication, your things sacrificed to idols. Um, yeah. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Oh, yeah. The Lord's words are the sword that's going to destroy the wicked. Now, in Revelation chapter 6, uh, you can read about the tribulation. And they talk about the horse and the rider was, uh, well, let's read Revelation 6, 4. And there went out another horse that was red, color of communism, that killed millions. I don't know if that's totally appropriate, but uh, it figures that communists picked red for their color for a reason. Red's the color of blood, right? And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. War. Verse 8. And I looked to behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. Death. And Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. A fourth part of the earth. You're talking about two billion people. To kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Four-legged beasts, like lions and tigers, or two-legged beasts? Take your pick. In Revelation 13, verse 10, we read, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. If we are called to be taken captives and to die for our faith, in Christ, we're to go willingly. If they want to kill you because of your skin color, well, Jesus said, buy a sword, right? Yeah. He says, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. See, when they were coming to take Jesus, Peter took out his sword and was going to kill the guy, cut off his head. But he missed and got his ear. And what did Jesus say? Put the sword back in your sheath. You know, it's not the right time, G uh, Peter. So, in Revelation 13, you can read about the false prophet and the beast. We read Revelation 13, 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. The false prophet's going to deceive the people that live on the earth with miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by sword and did live. Um... Is it going to be an actual sword? I don't know. Maybe that's just representative of war. But he's going to have a wound, and I believe it's the head. And everybody's going to think, oh, this one should be dead, but he's going to live. So, yeah. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to close this out. All right, let's read uh, Revelation 19 and close this puppy out. This is, uh, 
getting close to the end of the Bible. You know, there's only, you got Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22. And that's the kingdom, New Jerusalem, the whole deal. You know, I don't particularly enjoy being all doom and gloom. I, I don't like that. There is going to come a day, though, when wickedness and evil will be exterminated from the earth. And that will be a glorious day. But until then, here we are. Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And they'll tell you that the whore of Revelation, Mystery Babylon, is Rome. But uh, uh, the Bible teaches otherwise. The Bible tells you that the the whore shed the blood of the prophets. When did the Lord ever send his prophets to Rome? He didn't. It was the place where uh, King Josiah cleaned up that same place, his capital. Yeah. And think about it. The the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, and the false prophet, they're not going to be ruling from Rome. They're going to rebuild the temple, and they're going to be ruling from, take a guess where? Yeah. And if you don't worship the beast, guess what happens? You get killed. Unless, of course, you fly away in the pre-trip rapture. Whee! I don't think so. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, spiritual, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Oh, yeah. They're going to kill the servants of God, the Christians. And again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. The smoke of the burning of the Babylon. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, as the voice of many thundering, saying, Alleluia, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. You know, a church without spot and blemish, a bride without spot and blemish, that's what the Lord wants. Right now, he's got a whore. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And like I say, the Catholic Church isn't the one that decides who are the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is, the testimony of Jesus is, the spirit of prophecy. Wow. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, 
And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Uh, Jesus ain't here to make peace on earth. 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, clothing, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies, and the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, the word of God, oh yeah. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He's going to strike them down. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. For he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. Just a little note here. Do you know why the United States is creating the Space Force? Because I think they're going to try to stop Christ when he returns from heaven in glory with the army. They're going to try. I imagine it's going to be a very sh short battle, but, uh, you know, what do I know? Verse 20. And the beast was taken. The beast is also called the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. The false prophet's going to be able to do miracles, people with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So the, the words that come out of Christ is a sword that's going to proceed out of his mouth and destroy the enemy. Think about it. All right, well, we've been looking at the end of the Bible. Let's take a look at the beginning real quick and we'll close this out. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, See, the power of the word of the Lord, the sword of the Spirit. So, You know, verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Verse nine, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. 
verse 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. See, there is power in the word of God. Absolutely. So, what can I tell you? And that, everyone concludes, I think it's part four of Sword series. The end. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.